The first thing that we need to look at when we talk about probability of failure, and, and I guess one of the key parameters in, in that equation, is going to be the failure rate. And um, when we talk about failures in safety and cemented functions, we typically consider two different failure modes. Uh, we look at what, uh, how, how, you know, does the safety function prevent uh, me from going to a safe state? Does it feel dangerous? Or does the a safety function cause a spurious trip? Does it cause a transition to the safe state when there is no demand from the process? Uh, so failure that prevents a device from responding to potential dangerous condition, that is uh, a dangerous failure, a failure that will cause the device to go to the safe state, that's referred to as a safe failure. All right, so what does that look like, right? I always need to think in examples, and the easiest way for me to do that is by thinking of a valve. I have a flow through a valve, and under normal circumstances, I want that flow to, to go. The valve is open. If uh, I want to shut down my process or whatever, that valve is closing down. Very straightforward to think about. Now, what are safe and dangerous failures in those, in those scenarios? Well, a dangerous failure would be any failure where that valve can no longer close. So for whatever reason, the process needs to stop. There is, maybe there's a high pressure or there's an overfill going to happen. I want to stop flow. And for whatever reason, that flow cannot be stopped. Uh, the valve is stuck in the open position. Uh, that will be a dangerous failure. And examples of that are a stuck stem. Right? The stem is stuck. You, know, you can remove the pressure from, uh, from the actuator. Um, and maybe it's a spring return actuator, but the valve just you know, sits there and doesn't do anything. Or um, you know, maybe the spring in the actuator is broken and, and, and you know, there's no force to drive the valve to, to, the safe, uh, you know, to the safe state. So those are two examples of dangerous failures. And one of the problems with dangerous failures is that they will lead to problems and that, that you, know, you will have an accident unless there is other mitigating uh, scenarios. So maybe uh, you have a relief valve uh, that will release pressure from a vessel or Maybe you have a containment dike around the tank to prevent overfill. Well, not to prevent overfill, but to, to, to minimize the consequences of the overfill. So that's an example of dangerous failures. So what are safe failures? Well, safe failures are failures that will bring the process to the safe state when there is no dangerous or hazardous scenario. An example would be, you know, I have flow going. I just want to keep going, operating, producing, and for whatever reason, all of a sudden that valve closes. We don't like these failures because they shut down our process and that means we're not producing, therefore we lose money. Typical example, think of a, uh, again, spring return actuator um, where we put it pressure to uh, open the valve, compress the spring. If for whatever reason there's a leak in that air chamber and therefore the actuator cannot you know, put pressure on the spring anymore, the spring will just simply expand and, and, and bring the valve to a safe position. That's an example of a safe failure. Uh, and again, we don't like these failures because they, uh, they will you know, prevent us uh, from operating. In functional safety, we're really focused on the dangerous failures. We really are focused on um, making sure that our safety and cement functions perform when they need to. Um, we tend to a little bit neglect uh, safe failures, um, but from a, any you know, production manager, any organization will say, you know, we don't want to have a spurious failure every day. You know, we want to take that into consideration as well. So in our simplified equation, you'll see that we will only look at dangerous failures. In our uh, calculations, we calculate both the probability of failure on demand as well as the mean time to fail spurious. So we do have an indication as to how often can you expect this safety function from causing a transition to the safe state when there is no demand from the process. There is no situation that you need to protect against. There's just a, a failure of, of one of the uh, pieces of equipment. The safe and dangerous failures are further divided into detected and undetected failures. And detected um, refers to the ability of self-diagnostics within the safety function to reveal a problem uh, that, uh, that is occurring with one of the products, or one of the components in that safety function. 
Uh, an example would be uh, if you implement partial stroke testing on that valve. Uh, so we said a dangerous failure would be a, a stock stem. If you would implement partial stroke testing, you would see, hey, that, that valve doesn't move. Uh, there is something wrong. And you would be able to reveal failures such as a stock stem. Uh, other failures like, let's say, seat uh, issues, you would not be able to detect because you only do a, a partial stroke. Um, so, um, you know, there's a different levels of effectiveness for, uh, for, for different tests, different diagnostics. Uh, many of the transmitters that we use in safety applications, many of the logic solvers, pretty much all the logic solvers we use in safety ap applications, have extensive diagnostics to determine internal problems. Um, and, you know, it could be as simple as having watchdogs to make sure that inputs change to um, you know, all you know, redundant calculations basically through two different means, expecting the same output and doing comparison diagnostics. So we use these diagnostics to divide our failures up into safe detected, safe undetected, dangerous detected, and dangerous undetected. The safe detected and safe undetected in a, in a um, you know, single non-redundant system will both have the same output. My, my output will go to the safe state. Uh, in one case, I know, hey, this was caused because of a failure. In other case, I, I will not know that, you know, I will not know what the cause is. I'll have to do a bit more uh, investigation. In both cases, the output is the same. For dangerous failures, you know, splitting them up in detected and undetected failures, that's kind of essential because the dangerous failure, you will not notice during normal operation. You could have a valve out there that is stuck open. It's not able to go to the safe state. Um, and you just don't know it because you've not tested it or there's no demand on the process that is requiring that, that valve from moving. Um, so it's, it's, a, you know, it's an unknown. Um, by you know, doing some diagnostics on that valve, and I'm not advocating partial stroke testing, there's a lot of things that you need to consider, uh, but just conceptually, by, by adding some diagnostics to that valve, um, you may be able to, uh, to detect some of those failures and convert those dangerous undetected failures into dangerous detected failures. And once a failure is detected, we can do something about it. We can go out and repair it before we actually rely on the safety function. On the slide, you see three additional failure rate categories. There are, is a, a category at the bottom that's called fail no effect. These are failures that, uh, of, of components uh, that have no impact on the outcome of the, of, the, of the safety function. So think of a resistor that is part of a filter in an, an output circuit of an analog transmitter. If that resistor fails open, the output will go to zero milliamps. If that resistor fails short, you, know, you may get a little bit of a noisy signal. The filter on, on, the, on, the, on the circuit may not be as effective, but uh, you will still be able to perform your safety function. So in that case, that, that second failure mode has no effect on the overall uh, ability for, for that component to perform a safety function. So that's, uh, that's what we mean with fail no effect. They are not taken into consideration in any of the calculations. They're just used for classification when you evaluate a product. Then we have enunciation failures, both detected and undetected, and those refer to failures of diagnostic circuitry. So if you have diagnostics implemented in your system and uh, the diagnostics fail, they could fail in such a way that they are no longer able to identify future faults. That's what we refer to as an enunciation undetected. There's also a way that they could give you a false positive. They say, hey, something is wrong, even though nothing is wrong. Those will be enunciation detected failures. And you, know, you may take an, a repair action to figure out what, what, what you need to do because that device just told you something is wrong. So those are a total of seven failure rates that we would typically consider in our SIL verification. Uh, consider, uh, you know, from, a, from a perspective, these are the failure rates that we expect from a device. There's a couple exceptions to that, and we'll get to that when we are starting to talk about sensors later on, uh, probably later on today. <laughs>